Hello, welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Rounds presentation today. My name is Joe Saramelli. I oversee Grand Rounds for the department. Uh, I want to say a couple of things uh, before talking about today's presentation. First, I encourage you to write any comments or questions into the Q&A or into the chat. I'll collect those throughout the presentation and can go through those with the presenters uh, at the end. Uh, there's our Grand Rounds team that works on the series overall and the presentations each week, including Semhar Braha and Mike Walker. We do record and archive uh, the presentations. They're in the department website under education and then Grand Rounds, usually about a day or two after the presentation ends. Uh, the 2022-23 series is funded by the Ripley Fund and the Garvey Institute for Brain Health Solutions, which is also sponsoring today's presentation. Uh, close to the end of, uh, of the presentation, I'll put a link for our Grand Rounds evaluation into the chat. I encourage you to, to fill that out. It's just a couple of questions that's helpful for me uh, for planning Grand Rounds. So that's all about the series. And now a little bit about today's presentation. Today, um, you may remember last week, we had a presentation by Dr. Eric Carlson on neuroscience uh, and his related research sort of part two in a neuroscience series on neuroscience updates uh, on the wild neuro hub training opportunities and research. And we have a panel presentation today uh, with Dr. Tom Daniel, Dr. Susan Ferguson, Dr. John Newmeyer uh, to talk over several things. Um, opportunities uh, for funding for neuroscience research, uh, new uh, sort of mentored experiences in, in research training and neuroscience, and uh, updates in general on neuroscience uh, within the department. Um, and each person will present uh, and we can have questions at the end that can be general questions, they can be specific to an individual based on the topic, but I encourage your participation uh, as an audience to write in with questions. And I'll say first, first we'll have, uh, first Dr. Daniel will present and then Dr. Ferguson and then Dr. Newmeyer. So, Actually, I think I'll just stop there to, to get right to it since we have three people uh, and turn it over to Dr. Daniel. Thank you very much. I'm going to quickly do my screen share. Uh, hold on and pull up my slide deck. And um, is this working for everybody? Yes. Great. And I'll just go to the full uh, view. And I, I'm, I'm going to be fairly brief. I, I just want to introduce people mostly to funding opportunities and research collaboration opportunities. First, um, I'm gonna focus on Weill NeuroHub and give you a little background about this. I, I also do this for Grand Rounds for Neurology. I'm happy to spread word anywhere. And then I'm gonna talk about my current role as the new uh, CEO of the Washington Research Foundation and how we like to fund postdocs and early career faculty uh, and give you some pointers to that. And this is in any domain, uh, certainly in neuroscience as well. So let me jump right in uh, with Wild NeuroHub. And I kind of want to make sure I leave plenty of time for John and Susan. Um, so Wild NeuroHub began in 2019. It was uh, based on a hundred plus million dollar gift from Sanford Weill. And it initially started at UCSF, and it now is actually three institutions, UCSF, UC Berkeley, and UW. And it really is a partnership among the three institutions. And it has two or three main mechanisms for research collaboration. We have something called the pillar projects that I'll tell you about in a moment. And then we also have investigator grants, next great idea grants, and also postdoctoral opportunities. Um, and it's all in the general area of neuroscience. And it is with this idea of developing um, uh, solutions for neurologic disorders and psychiatric disorders, how can we work together to solve some really hard problems? There are currently uh, six pillars that define NeuroHub, and I'm going to work you through them very briefly. Um, they are, um, uh, the first three are, um, largely looking at electrical methods for um, uh, neuromodulation. So this is BCI type work. And there are project leads that span all three institutions. Uh, here at UW, we have Amy Orsborn, Jeff Ogeman, uh, John Heron, Chet Moritz, and others. And again, it's aimed at next-gen neurostimulation systems. And there's a cluster of people working together, and we're, we are actually trying to expand that program now. Uh, and we have funding for that. 
the other is uh, live brain imaging. Uh, this is actually live tissue imaging. So it includes uh, imaging of retinal systems um, that um, Saul Kato um, and um, others have been working on. Um, we also have neuroimaging with a next gen 7T that's just coming online at Berkeley. And that's a super high resolution uh, 7T system. I'm going to give you a little more information about that. And Tom Grabowski here is one of the leads of that. Um, and again, the next uh, four, next three are uh, deep neuro, which is basically um, neuroimaging uh, uh, data combined with other patient data to try and get harmonized data sets and include the common patient reported clinical biosample and MRI data sets. That's sort of like a big machine learning project. Um, there's an integrated patient-focused cell-based uh, approach to novel therapeutics. And this is actually partnering with some CRISPR technologies. Jennifer Doudna at UC Berkeley is leading that effort, the uh, sort of founder of CRISPR. And finally, there's a data analytics core, which is machine learning, AI, that's exploding right now, as you can imagine. And I'm well aware of uh, sort of AI-enabled psychiatric diagnoses that are going on. Uh, there's some really interesting projects uh, and potential there. So these are the six dominant foci of uh, NeuroHub, and they were each funded with significant um, contributions from that initial seed funding. Let me let me just pull out one of many um, ideas, and 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 that is that um, this idea of brain imaging with le feeding into this sort of deep neuro or deep neural network, deep neuro analysis, and the data analytics core. Um, that's a very exciting area. Um, this a new seven T project um, has really really high resolution, about two hundred to three hundred micron resolution, about 60 times sharper than standard MRI. Uh, it can see, you know, even layers, uh, cortical layers. So it's really, really pretty impressive system coming online. Here's an interesting question. It's just at this point, a question that we're hoping to make some real progress on. And the question that the teams are asking is, can you take state-of-the-art AI methods with data from the 7T, along with paired data on 3T or lower resolution systems, and enable high resolution interpolation from lower resolution seats, uh, 3T. Um, methods like this are being done right now for light microscopy, training data sets on a mixture of very high resolution and low resolution to extract high from low. Uh, these will be a really interesting computational uh, project that's just starting now with NeuroHub. Um, we also fund, uh, and I want to make sure I don't talk too long, um, seed funding and investigator awards. Um, these are inter-campus pursuits of novel projects, and um, teams can apply. Uh, the investigator awards require that you have a partner at each of the other institutions. Uh, the Next Great Idea Awards can just be pairwise. Any pair of institutions can work together. And then there's a, a bunch of postdoctoral fellows. Um, these are two years, 75K per year. Um, I should say we're in active discussion. I've, I, I've told uh, others about this in um, maybe standing up at something like the Fellowship Award, but for clinician scientists. That is early career MDs that are stepping into academic research as well. Um, so we're just thinking about that program now. And this actually is linking over to my other role at Washington Research Foundation. Um, let me just give you an example of some of the um, projects that we've been funding. We have some on non-coding parts of the genome, addressing neurodevelopmental disorders using um, CRISPR type therapeutics. We have some gene editing similarly on multifocal uh, leukoencephalopathy. Uh, in the uh, neuromodulation, we have two um, BCI projects, uh, one on brain coprocessors, led in part by Rajesh Rao here, and the other is on automated deep brain stimulation, optimizing that for various indications, in this case, Parkinson's. And uh, that's being led by Jeffrey Heron in neurologic surgery here. Um, 
And this is just uh, the brain coprocessor one that uh, Rajesh Rao, uh, Ankan Dragan, and Karnesh Ganguli are working on at UCSF. And this is basically restoring function by AI-enabled coprocessors. These are you know, recording from uh, one brain region, stimulating, say, motor cortex in another, and how can that be tuned? How can you? How can that system learn, goal, and refine brain stimulation? A really interesting set of topics, and they have um, just I think just put in an R01 on this. And I'm not sure of what the status is on that. Um, and another hope, of course, is that the funding we provide leads to additional NIH funding. Uh, this particular project is really exciting in that it's really using some of the state-of-the-art AI methods. Um, I'm sort of partial to that. Here's just, um, just give one example of these many here in the Next Great Idea Awards, but there's you know, indications from stroke, tumor, developmental disorders, pain, retinal degeneration, and neurodegenerative diseases. I'll just select one of these uh, just to give you a highlight a particular project. Um, and this is functional dynamics of the non-coding genome. And um, this has David Hawkins and genome sciences here as part of it. And they're looking to find genetic switches that control neuronal development um, and how you can take these to um, see what sort of gene modification you could do to perhaps uh, identify mechanism and also address uh, therapeutic development. Um, this is a pretty exciting project. It's in its second year now, and um, we're just watching how this progresses. Um, so looking at gene regulation and eventual CRISPR, uh, you know, modification is interesting. Of course, this addresses or raises the issues of CRISPR treatment in uh, neurologic disorders. Um, I would want to end my brief statement of NeuroHub uh, talking about a new project uh, that's just launching an alliance with Roche and Genentech. Uh, they've made a 10-year agreement with NeuroHub for 53 million, and that's 53 million contributing to investigators within the community of our three institutions. Um, and this will focus currently on MS, Alzheimer's, ALS, autism in a series of uh, thematic areas. Rosian Genentech scientists uh, are also partnering with uh, NeuroHub scientists. And Rosian Genentech appear to be spending about three to four X at 53 million internally. So these teams are addressing a set of focal projects. Um, they funded the first set prior to UW joining this uh, NeuroHub. But we've now, uh, as of last January, um, we are now formal members and have an IP agreement with Roche and Genentech, allowing UW scientists to now join in on this. So there will be an expansion of this program, and I, I, I hope to make sure everybody is aware of when there's an option to join in and, and collaborate on this. This, this could be quite exciting. Um, so the initial set of projects are approaching their completion, and there's likely expansion for the future. Um, and so neurodegeneration and computational neuroscience are some of the dominant areas right now. Um, and that's a very exciting program. So very quickly, I'm just going to quickly just say I <laughs> retired from the UW uh, in September and started as uh, the president and CEO of the Washington Research Foundation. And we are interested in supporting you. And I'll just say that. And I just want to give you a quick uh, overview. We provide grants directly to faculty. Uh, we've done over 100 million in grants to the UW uh, since uh, about 93. Um, and we're uh, supporting a bunch of startup companies as well. Um, and so if you have startup companies that you're looking at, we also support that. Um, we have also supported um, investments in big companies and uh, as well as um, some early stage companies at, in, in Washington State. Um, we are not just UW, uh, although I would say the bulk of the funding grew out of uh, IP that comes out of one colleague here at UW, Benjamin Hall, 
and the very famous Hall patents associated with Hep B vaccine, Gardasil, and the like. Um, we have an active postdoctoral uh, support program, and that's opening. That it's going to open in May. We're going to fund ten to twelve postdocs. So if you have somebody you think would make an excellent postdoctoral candidate, uh, please keep your eye on uh, Washington Research Foundation. Uh, they're pretty competitive. Uh, we, I think we got about 300 applicants last year, um, but they fund a, at a very high level uh, and they are amazing postdocs uh, that we've been uh, supporting. Um, we also fund a bunch of undergraduate programs as well, and we'll continue to do that across the state. Um, the most recent gift we gave was to Seattle Children's Research Institute on um, their postdoctoral scholars program. And this is bringing diverse postdocs uh, in to deal with pediatric disorders. Um, this is about a $12 million grant. Historically, we have funded at a similar level, uh, big programs at UW, the Institute of Protein Design, the UW Institute of Neuroengineering, which I used to run, and um, the eScience Institute and the Clean Energy Institute and Regenerative Medicine, each at about you know, averaging about 10 million over five years. And we are actively looking to expand our significant grants program right now. So big ideas in neuroscience are of great interest to us. Um, finally, if you are interested in um, grant that may take your basic research and move it along towards more commercializable ideas, uh, we have a very standard uh, mechanism for supporting things up to $100,000 for your first year, quarter million for your second effort, and up to a million for subsequent efforts. And these, uh, uh, you just go to our website and it's really easy. There's no deadlines. You can hear very quickly from us. Our, our grant staff love to talk to PIs and help you decide, are you ready for one of our grants or not? So there's very little wasted time in these efforts. But this particular form of funding really does have commercialization or IP as a, as a part of it. Uh, that was sort of by design from the original inception of the WRF. And finally, I just want to alert everybody to the fellowship program that we have at Washington Research Foundation. Um, I, I think it's sort of a jewel in the crown of our organization. And we are looking very seriously at coordinated large scale uh, postdoctoral programs like Seattle Children's, potentially in neuroscience, potentially in immunology, potentially in regenerative medicine, other areas like that. Um, it's just some example of some amazing postdocs. Um, and um, I will skip the early stage investing, although, you know, the most recent investment was an amazing microscope system um, by some uh, faculty here at UW in pathology, uh, light sheet, open top light sheet microscope for 3D reconstruction of tissue. Really, really interesting. Uh, and there's a bunch coming online. So we have about 40 active companies that we're supporting. And I just want to stop there. And should anybody want to uh, talk to me about funding from WRF, I'm more than happy to do that. And I think I've left enough time for the rest, I hope. Okay. I'm hoping you guys can hear me and see my slides. Great. Okay, so I actually just want to spend a few minutes here before I turn it over to John, kind of highlighting some of the uh, training and research opportunities that we have uh, for trainees, um, mostly geared toward our um, the basic sciences preclinical uh, research in the in the division. Okay, and so close this so I can see my slides. So um, one of those that I think is really neat, we started two years ago, is this annual fall open house that we're now doing. Um, the participants of this program um, are ADAI, CSHRAB, and HART, all uh, centers um, in the department. There's also the uh, NAPE Center, which is our Neurobiology of Addiction, Pain, and Emotion Center, which all of our uh, basic science um, psychiatric division neuroscience group is part of, and then SDRG, 
um, in the School of Social Work. And basically the goal of this open house is to increase awareness of UW research opportunities, as well as uh, careers in substance use and addictions um, with the goal of increasing the pipeline of researchers, especially those from diverse backgrounds. And so that's really what our, our outreach focuses on is trying to recruit people to come to this open house and learn about opportunities, um, especially from groups that the NIH has identified as um, URMs or folks that are underrepresented in the scientific workforce. And you'll hear that term URM a couple of times in my presentation. Um, this is the definition below here that, that the NIH um, uh, means when they say URMs are a number of different racial and ethnic groups, individuals with disabilities and individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds. Okay, hold on here, oops. So we also have for undergraduates two um, really great summer research um, fellowship opportunities. One of them is the Jeremy Clark Summer Research Fellowship. Um, this was started a number of years ago now when Dr. Jeremy Clark passed away and it's to honor his memory and contributions. Um, so he was uh, part of our psychiatric neurosciences group um, he had uh, very seminal contributions in understanding circuits that are regulating motivation and alcohol use and alcohol use disorder. And uh, this fellowship funds two to three um, summer research internships per year. Um, what's neat is the awardees, their names are actually engraved on a plaque that are displayed in the department. And at the same time, this one's happening, uh, the NAEP uh, program also has a summer undergrad research program. The goal of that one is to increase opportunities uh, for URMs, and that funds up to six summer research internships per year. And both of these uh, fellows from both of these programs, they participate in some um, pretty great professional development opportunities that are held weekly uh, during the summer for them. Okay, so another program that I wanted to call your attention to that I'm really excited about is our new uh, post baccalaureate uh, research program. And so it's called UW SOAR, um, SOAR standing for Significant Opportunities in Addiction Research. Um, this is running through the department and we just received funding this year to start it from an R25 funded through NIDA. So I am the co-PI PI, along with uh, Dr. Paul Phillips, who's also a professor in the department. And uh, for this first year, it's going to fund four uh, full-time postdoc students. And then um, for the next years, it's going to fund eight per year. And each uh, trainee has the opportunity to spend two years in the program. And so the mission here is to really increase research and training opportunities for those individuals that are from undergraduate institutions. So they're graduates of those places. But during their time there, those uh, institutions did not offer significant research opportunities. So the goal here is to close the gap of training diverse populations by providing them both with laboratory and didactic training um, in order to make them um, have competitive applications uh, to go into the PhD programs. And so we have a lot of, of program components uh, that we're starting with this experience. Um, one is, of course, you know, the research that they're going to have. Then we have a lot of different scientific development. Um, there's gonna be seminars that they'll attend, research presentations they'll give, they'll go to lab meetings, they'll go to conferences. They'll have opportunities to do uh, coursework, including a three course addiction neuroscience series uh, that we put on uh, for graduate students. They'll attend a neuroscience boot camp and a grant writing workshop. We'll do lots of different team building um, kinds of activities, including within their program through the greater UW community. And then we hope to do some, some things with industry partners. Um, there's gonna be a lot of career and professional development opportunities during their, their years in the program. And then importantly, they'll attend a graduate school workshop as well as an application course. So again, that they can have a, a you know, pretty competitive application for graduate school. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight are some opportunities for our graduate and postdoctoral fellows. Um, so one of the main things we have in the program is, or in the, in the department, is a NIDA T32 training grant. Um, the current PIs on that are Paul Phillips and then uh, Charlie Chafkin, who's in pharmacology. Um, the competitive renewal is going in in the spring, and I'll be replacing Charlie as, as the co-PI. And this is a longstanding training grant. It's currently, currently in its 30th year of funding. And we have slots for up to 10 um, graduate students and postdoctoral fellows total uh, per year. And so it, it, of course, provides that research opportunities, but then lots of different professional development training. And the other program I wanted to highlight um, 
it's it's not running through the department, um, but I think it's a really neat neat program that we have, and certainly people from the pro program can or from the the um, psychiatry can participate. And it's the UW Morehouse um, MSTP partnership. So how this works is if you're um, a doing your medical school at Morehouse during those first two years, this is down in, in Atlanta, they can apply to the UW MSTP program. And if accepted, then they come up here to conduct their PhD. And then once they graduate, they go back to Morehouse for their last two years of medical school. And you know this is really great because it provides biomedical research training to Morehouse uh, medical students who don't have a lot of research opportunities there. And I actually have uh, one of my uh, students is part of this program. He'll be finishing up his PhD this spring and going back to Morehouse. And I think it's a great way for us to continue to kind of expand our UW community um, out to you know other states in the country. And so it's, it's been a really great experience. And with that, I'm going to end. I'm going to stop sharing and turn things over to John. Thank you, Susan. Everybody seeing one big slide? OK. Yes. Well, I really appreciate um, uh, what you each have told us about. And I want to echo um, one aspect in particular, which is how each of these different, um, each of our two presenters just now mentioned, the importance of the pipeline of researchers who can then potentially continue to contribute over many years at, to University of Washington and to the health of our community. And so today what I'm going to do is tell you um, a little bit about the Division of Psychiatric Neurosciences. Now, you can all uh, find information on the uh, on the, the, our division by looking on the UW Psychiatry website. It's connected there. And I'm gonna just give you some highlights about it today. Um, currently we have 24 primary faculty, meaning that the primary, primary appointment is in psychiatry, but we also have six adjunct faculty who are also uh, partners and uh, active in our division. And four of the psychiatry uh, faculty also have a, a, a joint appointment uh, in another department, which happens to be pharmacology, I think, in all cases, um, although I hope I didn't miss any. Um, we have a distribution of uh, eight assistant professors currently, uh, three associate professors, and 19 full professors. And I wasn't sure exactly how to give you an overview of such a diverse um, uh, group, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the structure of the division, and then I'll tell you about some activities of some of the assistant professors. We have uh, faculty at these four major uh, research sites. Uh, uh, most of the work is, um, much of the work is basic neuroscience or basic and clinical neuroscience together, but there are some investigators who are focused exclusively on human neuroscience. We have folks at Children's, uh, at UW Medical Center, in particular down by the J&K um, wings. Uh, at Harborview, uh, where I was for many years, uh, although I more recently moved over to the VA. We have a new faculty member, um, Dr. Pravatoni, who has a, a large program at, at Harborview in the Research and Training Building. And then this is a picture, if you haven't been to visit us, at the new uh, Building 101 at the VA, which has a floor of uh, clinical and basic neuroscience research. So there are five sections, uh, and some of the faculty are in more than one section, but most, but for the most part, we have people listed in just one of these. Developmental neuroscientists who are focusing on, on disorders such as, as autism. Um, and clinical neuroscience has a wide range of, of different investigators studying both um, physiology and um, uh, imaging and other kinds of, of work. Uh, the behavioral neuroimaging section uh, includes uh, several people who are experts in neuroimaging and might be great partners for some of you uh, who are doing other kinds of research that's not in the neuroscience domain. Um, we have a number of people doing uh, behavioral genetics now. Uh, that's uh, uh, off, it, it involves collaborations with the Department of Genome Sciences in many cases, and uh, quite a few people working in molecular and cellular neuroscience. So today I'm going to tell you about six uh, of the assistant professors, uh, kind of demonstrating uh, a range of their research programs and how they, they these all have been productive and they're fund, individually funded investigators. 
In fact, when I realized, when I looked back on uh, this group, that all of them uh, came out of our pipeline, either our clinical or our postdoctoral training pipeline. Um, and, and in some cases, um, they have shifted towards uh, towards um, more a, a new kind of research than what they were trained in earlier. So uh, this really emphasizes the value and importance of the training that we do in the department and, its, and the university and how it can contribute to future research. Now, I have to tell you, I'm not going to try to, to uh, uh, recite the pedigree of the individuals when I talk about each of them, uh, because I will make a mistake and leave somebody out. Uh, but many uh, people contributed to the success of these individuals, and, and they stand shoulder to shoulder and on the shoulders of, of researchers who have helped train them. And they are now training the next generation. I'll also mention that they each gave me slides to share with you to give you a flavor of their kind of research. And that is uh, caused me more anxiety than anything else this week because I'm hoping I don't say anything terribly wrong about their research projects. So I'm gonna start with Rebecca Hendrickson. She came to us through the research track of the residency. And I wanna mention that today is match day for the Department uh, of Psychiatry. We had a great result. And in fact, our research track matched uh, all four slots. And all four of these individuals have histories of um, working in the basic neurosciences or in genomics, but two of them are thinking about shifting towards more clinical research, which is a common uh, uh, pivot point as they come into residency. And we are absolutely delighted to have them join us. So um, Rebecca uh, has um, been focused, at, she works in the MIREC, she, she was a fellow uh, in the MIREC and now um, has a career development award there. Um, and she has been interested in uh, the psychophysiology and uh, clinical phenomena uh, and treatment of people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And uh, in addition to the emotional challenges uh, experienced by people with PTSD, they can have uh, a number of physiological uh, changes and cognitive changes. And um, the questions that Rebecca has been trying to address is what are the, the brain processes that um, modify the, the risk for developing uh, PTSD and for the chronicity of PTSD and, and how understanding those uh, brain-based uh, phenomena might uh, lead us to improve the treatment of PTSD in the future. So her program um, focuses on three pillars. I guess um, we all aspire to have six pillars like the, the Weill Neuro Institute, but for now, three pillars isn't bad. Um, and she has uh, been focusing on the, uh, the broad range of symptoms that people can experience with, uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder and how to individualize uh, uh, treatments and to have, uh, she's been using a, um, a very novel strategy of N of one clinical trials in some cases, but also trying to identify um, predictors of, out, of success in treatment and uh, to perhaps develop better biomarkers that will lead us to treat people more effectively and earlier. Um, some of these um, strategies are really quite novel, and um, others can be gleaned from large uh, national data sets. And, and so she and her uh, trainees are investigating um, these uh, different kinds of approaches to try to get more insight into the brain of people who have post-traumatic stress disorder. Here's an example. It's a study called the PREDICT study. Um, at, in the MIREC at the VA, uh, Dr. Raskin and colleagues over uh, the last generation have, have identified and, and developed the use of prazosin for the treatment of, of a variety of symptoms associated with PTSD. Um, and she uh, developed an interesting project, uh, uh, Rebecca did, to um, try to understand uh, whether there are biomarkers or clinical symptoms that predict a, a, a higher likelihood of responding to prazosin. And so she um, uses a number of strategies like pupillometry, which has been uh, likened to a, a window into the noradrenaline system in the brain, 
uh, whether change, whether having um, high blood pressure baseline is a predictor of responding to prazosin, which is an alpha antagonist, and it was traditionally used uh, for the treatment of hypertension in the past. And she has been um, uh, investigating this in the PREDICT study, which I am only mentioning briefly now. Um, I'm next going to tell you about Ab, uh, Abigail or Abby Schindler, um, who uh, has the um, the iterative translational lab here, also at the VA, and she um, came up through the uh, graduate school, postdoc, and into the faculty uh, here, and has been now training the next generation uh, of postdocs and grad students. Um, so Abby has been using an interesting iterative approach, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of it. Um, one has to do with the gut microbiome. Many of you have heard of, about this, and um, there are changes in the microbiome that um, are a consequence of stress disorders, but also they can contribute to stress disorders. And um, the model system that I'm going to tell you, one of the model systems that she's using is one that several uh, labs here at the VA are, are leaning on right now. And so I want to explain it just briefly. This is a picture of a blast tube that is used to, to model the kind of uh, exposure to an explosion that a veteran might experience. Um, and it very carefully um, uh, replicates the pressure wave that might be experienced in a typical uh, uh, blast uh, exposure. And so animals can be placed in this tube and then uh, receive a very uh, highly defined uh, pressure wave that uh, causes a whole range of secondary phenomena, both uh, psychological and physiological. Uh, one thing that it does is it leads to changes in anxiety behavior and cognitive behaviors, but it also can change, lead to changes in the uh, microbiome and the pattern of bacteria that can be called, um, detected by PCR. Now, one of the key factors of her research is trying to uh, translate both forwards and backwards, and she uh, found that in uh, in individuals with post-traumatic stress disorder, there are also some profound changes in the microbiome, and there are some correlations between what is seen in the animal model and the humans. Um, we know that PTSD is associated with a number of GI or gut uh, side, uh, symptoms and, and syndromes, so this makes a lot of sense. Um, and ultimately, it you might be able to turn this uh, cycle backwards by seeing whether changing the microbiome might alter the brain's response to um, to stress or chronic stress through uh, either depleting the gut microbiome or, dare I say it, a, a, a fecal uh, microbiome transfer. So how is the brain connected to the gut? Well, um, both through the blood system, but also through the vagus nerve. And another branch of her work has focused on uh, abnormalities in the autonomic system. And um, she has become very intrigued by vagus nerve stimulation, which can be used for the treatment of epilepsy, but also for depression uh, and possibly for other stress disorders. Uh, and um, we know that the, that the vagus nerve and the, the um, abnormalities in the autonomic nervous system are reflections of, of chronic stress, and that can and also uh, are produced by the exposure to uh, this blast wave that I mentioned earlier. And this is shown here in, in terms of the heart rate variability, which is a uh, a very insensitive and impactful uh, measure of st stress uh, in humans as well as in animals. And you can see that a loss of heart rate variability is a, one of the consequences of blast injury. So the question is, can that be somehow um, modified some way? Well, um, she's not only looking at these physiological measures, she's also uh, been looking at the um, changes in the brain itself. And here we can see changes in the microglia and their, uh, their density in one of the nuclei that's involved in receiving sensory information from the periphery. Um, so what could we do about this? Well, there are implantable vagal nerve stimulators, but there are also ones that can be applied transcutaneously. And she's interested in modeling this using mice. 
and to see whether we might be able to reverse some of the stress effects that she observes after uh, blast injury. And two examples that are shown here are a reduction in the in the cytokine that's induced by um, by sham uh, or excuse me by by blast injury and um, IL six is an important uh, one of these cytokines and similarly the startle uh, response seems to be diminished in blast exposed mice that have received this vagal nerve stimulation so I think that um, in addition to this kind of of, of modeling phenomena that that she sees in that are observed in humans in mice she can then potentially develop or model treatments that could be translated back into humans next i'm going to tell you about james maybon who's also at, at the va not everybody today will be from here and uh, uh james's lab has uh also used um, the blast tube that I mentioned to you, and he's very interested in trying to identify other kinds of biomarkers and impacts on the brain of this kind of blast injury that may have been missed in the past and not appreciated. And he's doing so by modeling the blast injury in mice, by looking for uh, changes in the microRNAs as a biomarker in mouse blood and also um, by looking for biomarkers in individuals who are actively undergoing uh, 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 blast exposure in, uh, in, as veterans or in the in their service and then in, uh, the his, in veterans that have a history of blast exposure. So she, uh, James has found that um, there is an increased uh, density uh, and localization of microglia. These are the immune cells that are important in responding to damage in the brain. Um, and he detected these throughout the mouse brain. And this was um, also found in a, he found in a postmortem neuropathology study in, in veterans who had been exposed to blast, uh, concussive blast injuries. And um, this is now can be translated into um, living veterans by using uh, imaging st strategies. And this is a picture that shows um, a method for looking at the integrity of white matter. And he found that there are um, abnormalities in the, um, in the white matter uh, that can be detected after blast. And these are uh, individuals who had mild traumatic brain injury that previously may have been thought to have fully recovered, but in fact having long-term changes in their brain function. So um, both in human and in animal studies, he's able to use a battery of extensive histological markers for, cha for changes, pathological changes in signaling in cells and the structure of the brain and in the, the presence of microglia and he uses um, some very sophisticated neuroanatomical mapping of these changes and correlating what's changing in individual cells um, to try to develop um, better hypotheses about where in the brain changes are occurring and how those might contribute to symptoms. And that will potentially lead to the development of better markers for subtle but chronic impacts of, of um mild traumatic brain injury, but also to new treatments in the future. Anna Sunshine is another uh, individual who came through the clinical and, and the graduate training uh, pathways at the University of Washington and now is an assistant professor and has been studying um, families with schizophrenia in a very interesting fashion. She works also at Harborview in the, um, the uh, early psychosis clinic and is actively interested in identifying families with an individual who has schizophrenia who might be interested in participating in a research. And she and her colleagues um, will use deep, um, deep sequencing of the uh, individuals uh, in the family to try to identify potential risk genes that could be contributing to um, their uh, the family member's uh, schizophrenia or psychosis. And this kind of deep sequencing may have a variety of different implications, not only in understanding 
uh, the pathophysiology of schizophrenia better, but possibly also for the responsiveness to treatments that we have. And so um, I think that while we've mentioned animal translations um, uh, in our previous uh, examples, she is using an interesting strategy with um, induced pluripotent stem cells which she can try to replicate the genetic disruption that she identifies in a family to identify how does that change the the neurons that develop from these cells how are how is the how do their uh, gene expression patterns change and how does their uh, function and physiology change she can do this right now using ips uh, derived cell lines but in the future she hopes to do so with uh, ips cells that are derived from the individuals themselves and so that is a, an exciting uh, forward and, and retrograde uh, type of translational research. Garth Terry is an, um, another uh, psychiatrist who came through the, the Myrick Fellowship, and he has two general areas of, of research interest. Um, he's an expert in uh, positron emission tomography and has been working in the development of ligands for um, a variety of different potential uh, targets that might be a, a, a source of collaboration with some of you listening today. In particular, he's focused on neuroinflammation. He's focused on the alpha one A uh, adrenal receptor and developing better markers for uh, for this and uh, that can be used in, in human imaging. And he's also very interested in endocannabinoid system and in the um, the use disorders associated with cannabis. Um, I'll just mention briefly, I'm not going to show you data from the endocannabinoid system, but, but the cannabis or THC acts at the CB1 receptor, which is the, the, the most richly expressed G protein coupled receptor in, in uh, mammalian brains. And these, uh, these receptors can be imaged and they can also be the systems, uh, the endogenous systems that signal through these receptors may be important targets for uh, therapeutics. So he's looking at it from many different perspectives. I'll give you a quick example of, of the range of work that he's doing. So this is an example of a radio ligand binding to a rat brain uh, tissue section. And this is a conventional strategy that's been used for, for many generations. And one can identify ligands that have unique properties. And this is a, a, a secret radio tracer that is uh, binding to alpha 1a receptors it could be completely blocked by prazosin but not by other drugs that bind to different alpha 1 uh, subtypes so based on the on the chemistry uh uh and in his lab they can synthesize radio tracers using um uh, radioactive uh, uh, atoms that can be detected with PET imaging. He can study this in mice, but ultimately can translate it into humans. So this is an example of the same tracer that was used for uh, radio ligand binding being used to uh, to look in a, a live in a live brain from a mouse. And um, I'm not going to go through the details of this in detail, but the idea is that he'd be able to develop novel ways of examining the density and function of the alpha receptor, alpha 1A receptors in humans, ultimately. He's also been working on imaging of um, uh, inflammation, and this shows you uh, the impact of a blast injury uh, at a delayed point in time. You can see there's an ongoing neuroinflammation, um, and this can be uh, correlated with autoradiography. Um, he can also look at uh, situations such as stroke with collaborators, or in this case, West Nile virus, which you can see also causes a dramatic inflammatory response. The final person that I'm going to introduce to you uh, is Emily Newhouse. She's a, uh, trained as a clinical psychologist and researcher in her department as well. And um, she has interests in autism spectrum disorder and in the uh, behavior and in the uh, genomics of, uh, of um, autism, as well as in uh, the neurophysiology. So she uses a variety of different strategies to characterize and to deeply behaviorally and physiologically phenotype individuals who have um, autism spectrum disorders. She's collaborating with people in the Department of Genomics, uh, Genome Sciences, 
to, to investigate these, um, these different uh, genetic associations with autism. And for example, finds, and I know this is difficult to see, but different patterns of, of emotional and cognitive behavior in individuals who have different genomic uh, associations uh, that may be leading to slightly different clinical patterns. She also has a great deal of interest in EEG uh, as, as an, a method of looking at individuals, and this can be combined with psychophysiological testing. And um, I'm, I'm not an expert in, in this at all, but I think that in each of these cases, the, if you have questions about the particular science that I just gave you a taste for, I would encourage you to reach out to those individuals. So when I put these slides together, I kind of wondered, well, what themes have really uh, evolved uh, emerged out of this. And I think that uh, each of these very successful researchers came up through the pipeline of our department and will be continuing to develop these kinds of, of creative scientists who are really committed to improving health, ultimately. They're using a wide range of innovative methods. I didn't get into the details of that at all. Um, but they're also using both forwards and backwards translation. So they're, they're using what we learn from animal models to inform our understanding of the clinical problems and what we learn from patients to develop better models. And ultimately, this can lead to understanding the diseases better and to developing better treatments. I'm going to stop there and thank you for your attention and um, encourage you to reach out to these colleagues, think about potential collaborations, and uh, I'll take any questions, or I'm sure Tom and Susan will as well. Thank you, Dr. Newmeyer, Dr. Ferguson, Dr. Daniel. I think we could spend the rest of the time with very detailed questions about the methodologies that John presented on uh, of the six of the six people. No, just, just kidding, John. Uh, it's but, not April Fools quite right, yet. That's know, a couple right. weeks. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I think one one immediate question uh, that comes to mind, and I encourage any participants to write in uh, with, with with more questions, comments. I mean, here we've had a, a description of of a vision for, for funding of neuroscience research and current opportunities uh, in, in two domains, new and longer standing training programs uh, within the department and the university, and then the work um, example of six, six junior faculty in the, in the division. Um, let's say for someone who's not a neuroscientist, how, how might one uh, collaborate with a neuroscience research program in what way might that be synergistic? Can you give some examples about that, either from uh, funding, training, or or just on a project? Well, one way to collaborate is that if you're working with a population that um, um, that we that you there are qu open questions about how their brains are being changed by their disorder. Um, there, there's the possibility of developing um, new kinds of ways of predicting whether illnesses are going to get worse or whether they're going to respond to treatment. Um, and um, so I think the, the, everybody that I mentioned today is highly collaborative and really interested in hearing about new challenges. Um, I see there's also a question in the Q&A. Um, and it's an interesting question where um, somebody asks if um, the intermittent voice input that occurs with psychosis, I think they mean auditory hallucinations, might end up acting as a trauma on the brain eventually. And that's an interesting thought. I'd, I'd have to give that more thought, but one immediate idea is that the, the impact of a physical or a psychological stress is felt on, in both domains. It's not, they're not separable. So the physical stress of a, of a blast caused psychological changes that are, are being uh, characterized by my colleagues. And psychological stresses change the structure of the brain and change the body in many ways. And so I think that's an interesting idea and one I'm going to give some more thought to. I just saw a question come up uh, in the chat, uh, which was, is there a way to engage Genentech through NeuroHub? Uh, to partner a medical device. Um, I think right now the emphasis of the Roche Genentech partner is twofold. One is computational uh, efforts uh, for drug development and therapeutics, and the other is molecular methods and therapeutics. 
We are looking at other med device companies that are thinking about partnerships with NeuroHub. So it sort of depends on what device um, this M is thinking of in the chat. Uh, but there are some other companies that we're engaging with. It's, I, I noted that what, uh, the example of neuromodulation you gave was in movement disorders. Is there an interest as well in mood disorders, for yep. example? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So I just used the uh, sort of motor cortex uh, one, but in fact, neuromodulation and electroceuticals has become a, a, a really interesting space for uh, mood disorders as well. Um, I should also point out there's a, um, oh, MAB vaccines. Huh. Yeah, there might be. Um, we, you know, we're going to have an open call, I'm not too sure when, for potential partnerships with Roche and Genentech. And so this might be a computational vaccine design is another thing that might be coming up. So yeah, it's a great question. I didn't understand the device. Um, Tom, I, I think, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Dr. Pravatoni, but he's been working on developing vaccines for uh, uh, opiates among other things. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, so this is that that's interesting. So I didn't mean to do, uh, dominate uh, the Q and A. I, yeah, I'd encourage anyone else to write in a, a question comment um, if there's any more. Uh, there there may not be at the moment. It's uh, possible I achieved a degree of superficiality that suppressed all thought. I, I may have matched that, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Um, I, you know, it's, uh, I think we have had a, a, a lot of information from uh, different aspects of, of neuroscience. Susan, I wonder if there's other, other points related to, to mentoring development. I mean, it sounds like it's quite wide ranging, uh, different people at different stages in, in, in training. Um, I don't know. I'm try I, I guess that's not really a question, but are there any other additional points about how wide ranging that is? developing mentor skills in that area? Anything else you'd want to comment on? Yeah, I guess I would say, you know, the only thing is, so how John kind of mentioned, we've got some folks that maybe started in the basic sciences and moved clinically and, and vice versa. And we're continuing to look at ways that we can do that effectively sort of across our trainees. Um, and whether, you know, even if it's undergrads, how can we get them experiences that are a little bit of clinical research, a little bit of basic science and kind of expand the ability of those folks to do both things really well. And, you know, so whether that ends up being a master's program or some other kinds of, you know, creative things, not sure yet, but but certainly we're always thinking about it. As you were talking, the question came in, is there, is there a training program that doesn't exist that you think would fill a need, something that you you have ideas about that, that we don't have yet? Well, I have an idea that I would love to see a T32 uh, to support uh, people leaving our clinical training programs uh, to help bridge the gap to uh, uh, junior faculty. I'm not going to write that grant, uh, but I think somebody else should. <laughs> I, I would add in uh, to as a compliment to uh, both what John and Susan said are, are post baccalaureate programs, uh, expanding those, particularly for students from diverse backgrounds. There's a huge interest in this. And I, I also want to point out that NeuroHub is also building in a partnership with the Allen Institute. Uh, and they are also starting a post-baccalaureate program. So it's just lots of interactions uh, beginning to form in the area. Well, very, very good. We're, we're just at one o'clock, just a minute past one o'clock. And so we'll, we'll need to end here in, in just a moment, but I, I do wanna thank everyone. Uh, a a three-person presentation, uh, sometimes it's hard to fit into the presentation hour. I think we did it well covering, or you did it well rather, covering a range of topics. Thank you for this and for fielding questions. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate the neuroscience update and the range of information presented today. So thank you. Super, thank you. And Thanks. people are welcome to write to WRF and NeuroHub anytime. <coughs> bye. Yes, bye-bye. Folks, bye.